Hello ladies and gentlemen and welcome back to Fallen London. We are going to be having a look at the rest of the fine dining exceptional story and we are currently making dessert. Please, calls the pastry chef over the rising noise of the critic's kitchen. Please, can I have some quiet? Just for a moment. Just for this course. The critic approaches her station and rests lightly against the countertop. I think we got off on the wrong foot, she says. The pastry chef folds her arms and I will not make the concession of pretending that I like you. But she claps her hands. Quiet, please, for the dessert. The pastry chef looks down, grateful. Well, we only have one option here. It's a very modest challenge at 72%. We can make a fairly dicey meal. The pastry chef fetches a spray of flowers from the pantry, along with a bucket of cream. How about a syllabub? She says, what in the hell is a syllabub? Hang on, I'm going to look this up. It's because I want to have a vague in idea of what I am actually making, even though we don't have much of a choice. Syllabub. Syllabub is an English sweet, frothy drink which was popular in the 16th and 19th centuries. A dessert based on it, which is still eaten. Okay. The drink was made of milk or cream, curdled by the addition of wine, cider, or other acid, and often sweetened and flavoured. That does not sound that nice. But we shall see if we can pass. Hopefully, we do. Oh no! How did we fail at 72%? Disaster! The pastry chef hands you a bowl of cream and a whisk. I want to see peaks rising from that cream. You have five minutes. While you work, the pastry chef sugars the flowers. We're making a sort of a pot of flavoured cream. After five minutes, your wrist hurts and absolutely nothing in the bowl has changed. Give me that, says the pastry chef, as waiters begin to file into the room, ready to bring the dessert to the diners. She takes the bowl out of your hands, roughly, and glowers at the cream. We don't have enough time, she hisses into the bowl. You do not. The, the syllabub is sloppy, semi-liquid. The sugared flowers lend it an air of parody. Oh dear, the waiters carry the final course into the dining room. The pastry chef lets out a ragged, exhausted sigh. The maitre d' rushes into the room and grabs a rag to wipe the sweat from his face. The sous chef, he gasps. Everybody turns to face him. The sous chef is nowhere to be seen. He's out there, says the maitre d', gesturing to the dining room. Came out quiet as a lamb, said he might prove more useful than me. Well? says the pastry chef, witheringly. I thought he might, says the maitre d'. But he's talking to the diners. Um, so we can do nothing. It wouldn't be wise to make a scene in front of the delect. Besides, he might actually be helping. We can send out the maitre d'. The maitre d', skilled in the art of subtle yet firm persuasion, might be able to retrieve him. Or we can send out the pastry chef. This cannot continue. The maitre d' is too soft a hand. It's time to send out the pastry chef. I think we should do nothing. Look, hisses the maitre d'. He leads you to the double doors into the dining room. Through a thick crack, you can see the sous chef, flower stained. The rest of the kitchen assembles behind you. The pastry chef taps her foot against the floor. To everybody's surprise, most of all the maitre d's, the sous chef seems to be doing excellently. He walks politely to one group of diners, then another. The critic inhales sharply as she sees him approach the tiger, who looks up, curious. They talk quietly for a moment. They shake hands. You retreat from the door as the sous chef returns to the astonished kitchen and immediately gets to work poaching an egg. Nobody says a word. For better or worse, the dinner service is finished. There's only one thing left to do. Despite the efforts of a punnet of poisonous cherries, diametrically opposed chefs, and a slowly collapsing kitchen, you have somehow managed to serve four courses. An incredible effort by a group of people who would probably rather not have been involved. There is only one thing left to do. A tradition, explains the maitre d'. One of the cooks will speak as our guests are served their coffees and digestives. He sighs. As a conclusion, to the meal. Here, the illustrious chef would loosen his leash. Lion cooks have been known to go out. The sous chef delivered a poem once, in happier days, 
Tonight, the role falls to you. We can enter the dining room. The maitre d' stands beside the kitchen door, waiting. He leans lightly against the frame. The pastry chef brushes something from your shoulder. Wash your hands, she says. Don't make eye contact, says the line cook. Especially not with the tiger, says another. At her station, the critic pokes at some remnants of the dessert course. Don't listen to them, she says. You won't bite. Besides, he's had worse meals. He might even have cooked them. The maitre d' coughs politely and stands upright. Quiet, please, he calls, and the kitchen hushes. He opens the door and leads you into the dining room, which, upon seeing you, falls silent. The dining room is silent. Somebody shifts in their chair. High above you, chandeliers hang in the cavernous underground space. A cellist on the dais sets down her bow with a click. The face of 250 assembled diners turn towards you. Plain chairs, wooden-backed, have been arranged around the sides of the vast room, and waiters and waitresses sink into them. They encircle the diners, exhausted. At his table, near empty plates arranged around him, notebook to one side, sits the tiger. Beside him, the critic's black purse hangs over the back of her empty chair. Her silverware is untouched. So now we get to assess the damage. Perhaps you can gauge how the meal has gone down among the diners. The waiters and waitresses frown anxiously. Most plates have been cleared, but some have only been picked at. The diners sit back, dissatisfied. A demand for explanation hangs in the air. Suddenly, the tiger sneezes explosively. 250 heads turn towards him. Beside you, the maitre d' makes a sharp intake of breath. The tiger's eyes are streaming with... something. It crusts around their edges and trickles down his muzzle, turning the fur dark and sticky. What? whispers the maitre d'. Did you serve the tiger? Oh dear. Maybe he is allergic to that particular cut of meat. There is a tiny noise behind you, in the door to the kitchen. The pastry chef and the critic stand side by side. The critic has changed her apron and shifts from foot to foot nervously. The pastry chef stands, her arms folded, waiting. Behind the two of them stand the line cooks, arranged in a row. Further back still, you can see the bright lights of the kitchen, cold in comparison to the gloom and warmth of the candlelit dining room. Well, mouths the pastry chef silently. There is a long moment of silence and at last the tiger speaks this meal he says tell me who prepared it so we can credit the illustrious chef dolly's is his restaurant after all perhaps he deserves this review or we can claim the credit ourselves you were intimately involved in its production the illustrious chef definitely wasn't i think i'll claim the credit myself because if it goes horribly wrong, at least the chef won't go down. As the words leave your mouth, 250 diners gasp. The sound of the breath echoes up towards the high ceiling. Who? whispers an older woman, more to herself than anybody else. Is that? Other diners seem more relieved than anything else. They look at the plates of unfinished food in front of them, then back up to you. Of course the illustrious chef didn't produce this mess. This could only ever have been created by somebody else. Someone unfamiliar with a kitchen or good taste. A simple arrangement of ingredients on a plate. The tiger nods solemnly. Indeed, he says. He sits in thought for a moment. As the diners watch, he dips a claw into some leftover dressing on his plate, tastes it and nods. What a spread, he says, in a tone so measured that it is impossible to tell what he is implying. What a spread! Nobody speaks. Forgive me, he says at last, but I have to ask. This dinner, this whole service, did the kitchen find it 
easy to prepare. Uh, easy? No cooks? Okay, what can we do here? It was a complete disaster, in, in truth. Uh, let's go with describe minor problems in the kitchen. The tiger nods slowly, impassively. If the diners are hoping he'll tease his review in some way, they are disappointed. Their own responses are somewhat less measured. Something approaching understanding dawns on the diners' faces. You can see them forming some kind of timeline of the night's events, and their expressions change. Concern. Something must have happened to the head chef. Recognition. You must have led the effort to overcome it. Delight. The meal you produced was despite this. Excellent. Was it? <laughs> well, says the tiger, it has been quite a night. Thank you for your presentation. On the other side of the room, behind the tiger, the maitre d' has his eyes closed. His head rests gently on the shoulder of a waiter. The tiger smiles. That'll be all. You have a good evening. He gets up gracefully, and with a hook of his claw retrieves the critic's black purse from her empty chair, and then he leaves. There is a sigh of relief from behind you. Let's return to the kitchen. Your work here is done. It's time to say goodbye to the kitchen. Inside the kitchen, the stoves click and chatter as they cool. Someone has roused the maitre d' and he emerges through the doors with you and shakes you weakly by the hand. Well, you did it, he says. Back in the kitchen, one of the line cooks is preparing something for themselves, while another gestures fruitlessly at the mess the critic has left behind. What should we do with all this? He says. Goodness knows, says the critic. I didn't really think that far ahead. In the pantry, its shelves noticeably sparse. The maitre d' crouches in front of the paralyzed, illustrious chef. I'm going to take him home, he says. I suspect he'll be as right as rain sitting up tomorrow, he gulps. Ready to read the review. But we can say goodbye to everyone now, so let's say goodbye to the pastry chef. She tidies her station, wipes surfaces, fondly, carefully cleans her tools. One by one, pastry knives are wrapped in thin paper, slotted neatly into drawers. Among the mess of the critic's kitchen, the pastry chef suddenly looks very small. Goodbye, she says curtly. I do hope this has been instructive. Her shoulders sag. I am comforting myself, she says with the knowledge that when I return to this kitchen, you will not be here. Yeesh. Let's say goodbye to the critic. She eats a grilled cheese sandwich directly from a pan. The critic undoes a tight bow and takes off her apron. Beneath, she is wearing a black dress made from some kind of impossibly expensive silk, as well as a thin silver necklace, dressed for dinner. She breaks off a piece of grilled cheese and hands it to you, surveying the kitchen around her. You know, she says, I don't think this kitchen's changed a bit. And then she points, sandwich in hand, toward the pastry chef station. Of course, I used to sit over there. Oh, she used to work here? What? <laughs> okay, uh, say goodbye to the sous chef. Taking everything into account, he's had a rough night. I think, says the sous chef weakly, that I'm going to go home and, and lie down for a bit. He stands in the open doorway to the alley, smoking a cigarette. I'm going to lie down, and I'm going to think about what I did this evening. He finishes his cigarette and fumbles to light another. He is silent for a long moment. I don't think I did very well, he says straightforwardly. I wonder what Chef will say. I wonder how he's doing. He coughs. Please don't think any less of me. He lifts his gaze and looks you in the eye for a moment, then trundles off to find the maitre d'. And right, now we can finally say goodbye to the line cooks. The line cooks have found a bottle of wine somewhere. They perch on the edge of a station, drinking from the bottle. The line cooks pass the bottle between them, taking long swigs. They swipe their mouths on the backs of their hands. I don't think, says one, her words slightly slurred, that I ever want to cook again. Her companion laughs. I don't think, he says, that I will read the Gazette tomorrow. Not out of fear, 
No, not out of fear. He opens another bottle, for entirely unrelated reasons. When the line cooks see you are about to leave, one leaps up from the station and approaches. She shakes your hand. You're all right, she says. If you ever come back here, another line cook laughs. If you can ever face coming back here, let the maitre d' know you're in the house. We'll see you right. And now it's finally time for us to go home. One by one, the lights in the kitchen are extinguished and the stoves are doused. The room cools. Out in the dining room, waiters and waitresses sweep the floors and lift heavy chairs onto the tables. The cab driver who brings you home cannot resist commenting on the address from which she picked you up. Fancy food, she laughs. You know, throw a mushroom onto a plate. She whips the horses faster. Behind you, the restaurant grows smaller and smaller. A single mushroom, calls the driver. Barely food at all. And here we are. The review arrives. Oh, there's a few things here. A footman in Smart Must Delivery arrives at your door. I think that might be something else. Let's read the review. This morning, the Unexposed Gazette lands upon your doorstep with a slightly heavier sound than usual. The Gazette must be trying something new, because folded between the main paper and the customary pamphlets is a new food section. There are recipes, perfunctory and unappetizing. There are vaguely patronizing reviews of local food stands. And there, beautifully typeset under the headline, Dolly's reappraised. It's the Tiger's Review. Let's read the Tiger's introduction. At a glance, the review seems to be in multiple parts, separated by advertisements for other smaller restaurants. I am sorry to report, begins the Tiger, that I am disappointed. It breaks my heart. Perhaps if dining at Dolly's I had experienced something truly disastrous, I would feel more righteous in my criticism. Instead, the food I was served was simply bad, nothing more. And to write this brings me no joy. No single dish, he continues, struck me as glaringly bad at first, but the badness crept in unstoppably and inextraordibly. Things were overcooked, things were underdone, things weren't seasoned at all. I think we've done bad. The Sunken Star, reads an advertisement below the first page of the Tiger's Review. The best chow à la crème in London. The quality of the service, writes the Tiger, very dizzyingly. Some staff, obviously inexperienced, tried hard but fell short. Others worked with a barely concealed panic. More concerning than this, however, was the fact that an ingredient in the meat and cheese course rendered me unable to speak for several minutes. I understand, he continues, that this was not deliberate. Nobody in the kitchen was trying to poison me, much like nobody in the kitchen was trying to prepare good food. It soured me, however, even further. A boxed-in panel features a drawing of the illustrious chef, his moustache replendent. Perhaps the problem, writes the tiger, was that the head chef did not cook the meal I ate. Perhaps I have buried the lead. Perhaps when I saw a complete stranger carrying themselves with no culinary confidence seemed to claim credit for the terrible meal. I should have been less surprised. They described some minor problems during the production of the meal, but apparently overcame them. I would like to tell you, they did not. Not even a little. I am impossibly disappointed. I cannot quite believe that any of this was allowed to happen, and I continue to ask myself, in voices alternatively curious and dismayed, where was the head chef? As you turn to the final passage of the Tiger's Review, there is a knock at your door. Three strikes quick. By the time you reach it, whoever was knocking is gone. A faint smell of cologne lingers. At your feet a small parcel wrapped in butcher's paper. An envelope sits on top. You will have to wait, if only for a moment. In the pages of the Gazette, the tiger delivers his final verdict. Three slight paragraphs, a handful of words. The first time I visited Dolly's, begins the tiger, I found myself sceptical. I viewed the head chef with some measure of caution. 
The cavernous trappings for fine dining seemed a little gauche. The thirteen courses I was served, however, struck like a bolt from the blue. I awarded two cockades that night. Now I find myself wondering if my scepticism was warranted. Perhaps what I felt that night was the germ of this great disappointment lying in wait. I cannot, however, overlook the fact that the restaurant's head chef was not responsible for this mess. I have to believe that. As such, I will not be removing a cockade, but let me be as clear as I can. If I discover that I have been misled, a lost cockade will be the least of this restaurant's worries. Apparently a parcel sits on our doorstep. Through an open window there comes the smell of someone cooking. Sharp onions, perhaps shallots. The scent becomes bitter. There is not enough fat in the pan. The parcel on your rug is about the size of a shoebox. It is unaddressed. One corner of it is marked with a fatty thumbprint. Butter, no doubt. It is a letter from the illustrious chef. Any doubt that he may not have recovered is dispelled by the sheer energy of his anger. It pours from the page. Little splatters of ink dot the margins. The good name of my reputation has been deeply tarnished. His pen tears into the paper. You cannot conceive of the work I will have to do in order to recover. Despite this, he is deeply grateful in a kind of hurt, backhanded way that you took the blame for the disaster. It spared me, he writes, some measure of ignominity. Time to open the parcel, I guess. This can't be good, surely. This is the end of the exceptional story. Inside, something smells sweet. As you lift the lid, the sweet smell becomes overwhelming. Inside, nestled on a bed of torn paper, is a punnet of dark cherries. Their skin is taut. One has split, just a little, and a dark liquid oozes from within. From your neighbour's window, there comes quiet conversation. A cork leaves a bottle. There is a sound, unmistakably, of cutlery against plates. And this is the end of the exceptional story, The Set Menu. Well, I guess that's the end. Thank you very much for watching. Please like, subscribe, let me know what you think. Your comments are greatly appreciated. If you've got a different ending to that, please let me know. I am interested indefinitely. <laughs> and as always, I'll see you next time.